Madame la Commissaire, chère Madame Vestager, c'est un honneur pour nous de vous accueillir aujourd'hui pour la première fois parmi nous. À votre initiative, la Commission européenne a pris un certain nombre de décisions courageuses et importantes dans la mise en œuvre de la politique de concurrence. Et les plus, les plus emblématiques de ces décisions sont certainement celles concernant Google et Apple euh, qui ont été prises récemment. La politique de, de concurrence est une compétence exclusive de l'Union européenne et c'est une raison de plus euh, d'apprécier vraiment votre disponibilité pour discuter avec nous, même si la la politique de concurrence est une compétence exclusive. Elle concerne évidemment aussi la vie au niveau des collectivités territoriales et particulièrement quand il s'agit de l'application des règles de concurrence à l'action en matière de services d'intérêt généraux. En effet, à ce niveau-là, les collectivités locales et régionales sont souvent des fournisseurs de services et la politique de concurrence les concerne alors très pratiquement. Les villes et les régions doivent être soutenues dans cette tâche et il est important que leur action puisse être mise en concordance avec ce qui se passe au niveau des décisions de concurrence. C'est pourquoi, après votre intervention et notre échange de vues, nous adopterons aujourd'hui un avis sur les aspects régionaux de la politique de concurrence dont le rapporteur et notre collègue euh, Michael Murphy. Certains aspects de vos travaux, certains aspects peut-être moins médiatisés, sur l'application des règles de concurrence ont aussi un impact important sur la vie quotidienne des citoyens européens. Car la politique de la concurrence doit aussi améliorer la qualité et le choix des biens disponibles et stimuler l'innovation des biens et des services et ce, dans de très nombreux domaines. Il serait important d'apporter des clarifications nécessaires dans la qualification d'un service euh, social ou un service euh, d'intérêt général euh, social, et cela euh, plus particulièrement dans le domaine de la santé, par exemple. Prenons un exemple. Tout à l'heure, nous allons adopter un avis intitulé « Vers un programme européen en faveur du logement » de notre collègue euh, Hicham Iman euh, est le rapporteur. Et là, nous avons aussi un domaine où la compatibilité entre la politique européenne de la concurrence et ce que veulent et ce que doivent faire les collectivités territoriales euh, pose parfois des problèmes un peu complexes et délicats, comme vous le savez certainement encore beaucoup mieux que moi-même. Notre comité soutient que la politique de concurrence ne devrait pas limiter la liberté de choix des autorités locales et régionales dans la planification, la prestation et le financement des logements sociaux, par exemple. Il faudrait aussi supprimer la limitation de l'accès au logement social aux personnes les plus démunies ou aux groupes sociaux moins avantagés pour que ceux qui sont dans des logements insalubres ou ont des revenus trop faibles pour mener une vie décente puissent également y accéder. Vous le comprenez, euh, chère, euh, Madame la Commissaire, nous avons beaucoup de sujets d'intérêt commun et nous sommes particulièrement intéressés d'entendre maintenant vos réflexions. C'est dès lors avec euh, plaisir que je vous cède immédiatement la parole. Hello. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you for the, uh, the invitation uh, and thank you for, uh, for meeting uh, today. Uh, it is indeed a pleasure to, uh, to discuss uh, competition policy with you as representatives of our regional and local communities in Europe. Uh, and I especially want to thank Mr. Murphy uh, for his work uh, on the opinion on uh, our activities, because this is an excellent uh, piece of work. Uh, one of the things we share, and this is the reason why I'm so happy to be here, is that competition matters. It matters for citizens locally, regionally. Uh, it matters in our daily lives. Uh, and the point is, of course, that competition, when it works, 
empowers the citizen in the role as consumers. It gives citizens uh, a wider choice, prices that they can afford. It encourages uh, our businesses to innovate, to invest, and of course to service their customers, because then businesses know that their customers can go to somewhere else uh, and do their uh, shopping. And it is important, because when companies, big as well as small, play by competition rules, well, it helps to ensure that our economy grows, that jobs are created, and that the economy and the market works for everyone. Uh, and this is why uh, competition rules has been in the treaty since the very first day. And that is now 60 years ago, and in these 60 years, of course, our economies has developed, uh, but competition law enforcement is equally uh, strong. Uh, in his report, Mr. Murphy has highlighted a, a number of our uh, most recent uh, actions. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's a very good read, uh, so you want, if you want more in detail, uh, go uh, engage. Uh, with our inquiry uh, into e-commerce, well, we work to ensure that citizens can shop online without borders, uh, without uh, obstacles. Uh, with our case against the, the drug uh, company Aspen, uh, we're acting against price increases of several hundreds percent uh, of five uh, life-saving uh, cancer drugs. Uh, and by ordering member states to recover uh, selective tax advantages of multinationals, well, we confirm that the single market uh, should work for everyone and not just for the lucky few in a competition for state subsidies, because this is not what competition is about. Uh, in this situation, when it comes to the prices of life-saving drugs, when it comes to actually being able to have the choice uh, with e-shopping, when it comes to knowing that the business I work in, they pay their taxes, and we compete with other businesses, and they pay their taxes too. Well, this is a signal and examples of the market working for each and everyone and giving a fair chance of making it. At the same time, of course, the Commission must be confident to take a step back if that's appropriate. Uh, and when it comes to the area of state aid control, this is exactly what has happened. Because we agree with this committee that when public spending doesn't affect competition uh, at European scale, there is no need for us to be involved. Uh, we took a number of steps to turn that into reality, because agreement is one thing, acting upon it is another thing. And that we have done. Uh, of course, most of you have first-hand decisions about taking decisions to invest, invest in infrastructure, that be roads, digital infrastructure. Uh, actually, in 2015, uh, member states spent over 84 billion euros uh, on investments like this. Uh, and of course, governments need to know when an investment involves state aid and when it doesn't. So last year in May, we published what we call the Notice on the Notion of Aid. And this notice makes it clear when public investment is state aid and when it's not investment and when it's not state aid. This is the way of making it clear that when investment in roads, railroads, inland waterways, well, it's not state aid when they don't compete with other infrastructure of the same kind. Of course, you have a very special situation if you want to build a bridge ne next to a bridge or road next to a road, but I think we all agree that that would be kind of strange investment decisions to take. If you build a road, if you establish in inland waterways, if you build a bridge, what it says in the notion, notice on the notion of aid, it's not state aid. We're talking about uh, many projects also in the local communities, which are exactly local projects. And our notice also makes clear that these are not state aid because it doesn't affect competition across borders. And, and we're talking about things that can be vital in, in the local community. 
Uh, that could be investments in general hospitals. It could be investments in homes that cares for elderly citizens. It could be the upgrading of small ports whose users are mostly uh, local uh, fishermen. So, of course, there is no need for us to look at local matters because it doesn't affect cross-border competition. We've also made uh, things simpler for state aid spending uh, when it comes to uh, state aid that has not much of an effect on competition, uh, especially when you engage, uh, if you do, uh, by expanding what we call the general block exemption uh, regulation to make that bigger, to cover more areas so that member states, uh, authorities uh, can act without spending time uh, with the Commission. Uh, four years ago, uh, more than 30% of new state aid measures needed the Commission OK before they could go ahead. Now that figure is less than 5%. Less than 5% of state aid measures now need the Commission OK before they can go ahead. And this means that thousands of grants worth some 26 billion euros per year can go to support things like broadband connection, training, research, small and medium-sized businesses, green energy, without needing the Commission approval beforehand. Uh, in May, we took a step further uh, because we included ports and airports in the general block exemption regulation. Uh, your committee uh, gave feedback on the changes that we, we took uh, and we took this on board. Uh, of course, uh, we listen when we get this kind of qualified uh, input. Uh, the first beneficiaries of the new rules, they are regional airports that serve up to 3 million passengers per year. And this covers 70% of all European airports and 15% of air traffic. So now member states can maintain or upgrade these airports without getting the Commission approval in advance. In the general block exemption regulation, we state the criteria. It's a recipe, it's a cookbook. Following the recipe, everything is fine. For airports with less than 200,000 passengers a year, and that covers actually uh, around half of European airports, we've gone even further. Uh, these airports are the airports that keeps our regions and our cities uh, connected. So this is very important infrastructure. The thing is that it covers less than 1% of European air traffic. So it is obvious they don't have much effect on competition as such, no matter that they are very important for regional connectivity. So the regions and their citizens are now free to decide if they want to spend public money on these airports, including uh, operating aid. Because sometimes, for connectivity reasons, it can be important to spend money also on operating aid. For ports, now member states can invest up to 150 million euros in seaports and up to 50 million in inland ports. Uh, we've also simplified rules for culture and sports uh, arenas. Uh, support in these areas are often not state aid anyway. Uh, only a few very large projects are, and now even fewer projects need the Commission approval before they can go ahead. So we're working to simplify uh, wherever we can, and we are working to empower wherever we can. Because public spending, well, when it doesn't affect competition, cross-border competition, it should be something to be discussed between responsible elected representatives and the voters, and not lengthy discussions with uh, the Commission. We do hope uh, that even when uh, stated is then not exempted uh, from uh, Commission control, that you feel that it, that doesn't necessarily make it a problem. Uh, because for a lot of state aids, uh, we have a lot of public spending. We issue guidelines that enables governments 
to avoid state aid issues. Uh, these guidelines, they reflect, of course, core principles of state aid control. They reflect our experience, and if we on that experience can give guidelines that makes lives easier, of course we do our best uh, to do that. These principles, they are worth defending. Uh, because the point is, of course, that we must ensure that citizens and entrepreneurs who have uh, bright ideas are not kept out of the market by the companies who do receive uh, state aid. So aid should only be given when the market cannot deliver the pro project. Uh, and public, public spending should, of course, also be limited to what is necessary to get the project off ground. There is no reason to spend more uh, than necessary uh, of taxpayers' money. Because this guarantees that taxpayers get good value for their money, and it guarantees that EU member states do not start a subsidy race where only the richer countries can even participate. Of course, state aid must uh, create jobs, not destroy jobs. Uh, and that is why we prohibit support to incentivize the relocation of jobs from one uh, region of our union to another region of the union. So our rules leaves government and local authorities a lot of freedom to invest in our communities. Of course, it is then important to ensure the, um, uh, the trust and the transparency when it happens. Uh, and I am very, very pleased to hear that your committee uh, also calls for more openness in public spending. Because with the empowerment, with the things that can happen, of course it is important for citizens to be able to know how money is spent, why they are spent, and who gets the benefit uh, of the spending. Uh, since July 2016, Governments must publish some basic details uh, online if they award state aid uh, of more than half a million euros. They share the name of the beneficiary, the amount of aid, as well as the goal of awarding the aid and the legal basis uh, for that support. Uh, and since these new rules came into effect, uh, 25 member states have posted uh, just about 13,000 uh, AIDS awards online. So the transparency is improving for citizens and of course uh, journalists to look into how do governments spend taxpayers' money. Uh, this openness empowers citizens. Uh, when they know about the support that their government give, well they can discuss it with you, with other political representatives in their communities. They can ask questions, and they can make you do the follow-up uh, work if you find that it's needed. And of course, when government has more uh, freedom to invest, and citizens have an idea where their money is going, well, then here we can focus on the bigger cases where it does affect competition, where it does affect uh, cross-border uh, issues, uh, and I think that is a very, very uh, good division of labor. In the work of, uh, of Mr. Murphy and, and, and your committee, you list areas uh, where we need to take our work uh, forward. And this is what I will end with. We will remain vigilant uh, against selective tax advantages of multinationals. Uh, we will continue uh, to check that support for renewables helps market to make the energy transition. And we will continue to do our best to make sure that our regional uh, communities get the fast broadband lines to stay connected and participate in the rest of our society. Uh, but talking about uh, the new approaches, well, that's the easy battle. We have to make the work on the ground also in the regions that you all represent. And as you say in, in your report, trust in each other and the open debate, well, that is the cornerstone of our very union. 
Uh, and of course, uh, this includes also the trust uh, and the debates uh, between our two uh, institutions. Uh, and on that note, uh, of course, I look forward uh, to our exchange of views. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Madame la Commissaire. Vous avez vraiment dressé d'une façon très cohérente le tableau de la politique de concurrence de l'Union européenne. Et pour ceux qui connaissent un peu la matière, c'était en même moment aussi un certain cours sur l'évolution historique de la politique en la matière. Merci beaucoup pour cette très bonne base pour notre débat que je veux entamer maintenant tout de suite en donnant D'abord, la parole à notre rapporteur de tantôt, uh, notre collègue uh, Michael Murphy. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Madam Commissioner, uh, on behalf of the uh, EPP group, I would like to uh, warmly welcome you to our uh, plenary session and to thank you for a very uh, interesting uh, intervention. Uh, as you're aware, I am currently the rapporteur uh, for the opinion uh, on the European Commission Report on Competition Policy uh, 2016. And in this context, I had the privilege of meeting with you last September to discuss the views and concerns of local and regional authorities. I've tried to define these concerns in the best way possible, in my opinion, endorsing views from all political spheres and nationalities. I would like to refer to some key points in my opinion, starting by emphasizing that competition policy has a direct uh, impact on people's lives because it encourages, it acts as a key driver of innovation, entrepreneurship and efficiency and allows citizens, citizens that interact with the market not just every day but sometimes several times a day to gain the benefits of a true single market. The ongoing uh, antitrust investigation towards a leading company on the Belgian beer market proves exactly that. National competition uh, authorities can also play a significant role in ensuring that rules are respected. Your efforts to improve their effectiveness are most welcome. However, I am of the view that we need better resourcing of different member state national competition authorities, improved European coordination, harmonisation of them, as well as more cooperation with the Commission. Can I ask you, Commissioner, what is your view on this matter and how do you foresee improving this element of competition policy? Competition policy affects many sectors, but there, are, there is a specific need to implement competition enforcement in the digital single market. Ongoing barriers to cross-border trade in the digital single market for example, geo-blocking and potential competitors being artificially excluded from opportunities by dominant players should cease to exist. And this is why I welcome the agreement found earlier this month to end unjustified geo-blocking. Moreover, we need to ensure fair competition and prices in areas such as pharmaceuticals, the market of seeds, chemicals and pesticides, ensuring price transparency in the food supply chain is vital, vital for our citizens. In this context, again, Madam Commissioner, I would like to ask you for your method of cooperating with other commissioners and to what extent the cooperation with the Commissioner for Agriculture can be approved in order to support efforts towards market diversification for the agri-food sector. Commissioner, I come from uh, Ireland, a member state which will be enormously affected by the future withdrawal of the UK from the EU. In terms of state aid rules, this House asks for greater flexibility in their implementation in order to help businesses navigate the challenges raised by this withdrawal. Once the UK leaves the EU, it will cease to be subject to the prohibitions on state aid in the treaty. It is of utmost importance that we ensure that some form of commitment will take place from the UK side in this matter so that fairness exists and to limit the possibility of trading on different terms or without a state aid regime. It goes without saying that any agreement could still leave specific sectors, notably agriculture, that export into the UK under significant economic stress. Just one example, with a market share of almost 1 billion, 
and as the second largest import market for floricultural product, pro products, the UK is a major destination for suppliers and traders based in the UK or based in the EU, the Netherlands, Germany, Italy, Denmark and Belgium in particular. In Ireland, one third of our dairy exports go to the UK market. While I recognise that perhaps it's too early to say, I would, like you to ask, I would like to ask you to investigate whether the economic disruption caused by Brexit could or should result in an expansion of the general block exemption regulations and a temporary re relaxation or suspension of state aid rules for certain under undertakings and sectors most... Can I ask you to conclude? You have uh, uh, 45 seconds more than foreseen. Concluding, Commissioner, I would like to ask you whether you believe there is a clear understanding from everybody concerned as to the general decision-making process and how certain competition investigations are chosen and decisions are made. Your presence here today proves your willingness to take into account the voice of regions and cities. And in this context, I would like to thank you for your attention and I wish you every success uh, in your duties. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. La parole est maintenant à notre collègue Hicham Iman. Merci. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Madame la Commissaire, j'interviens ce matin devant vous en tant que représentant du groupe socialiste au Comité des Régions. Je suis un représentant wallon, élu de Charleroi et président de la Sambrienne, la plus grande entité de logement public en Wallonie. J'ai été à deux reprises rapporteur sur des sujets en lien avec votre portefeuille, en 2015 sur le paquet transparence fiscale et tout à l'heure sur un avis qui me tient bien à cœur pour un agenda européen en matière de logement. C'est un honneur de vous recevoir à double titre. D'une part parce que le soir, le plus grand quotidien francophone belge vient, Madame la Commissaire, de dresser vos lauriers, pas plus tard qu'hier, en, en vous présentant comme une superstar de la Commission. D'autre part, parce qu'en tant que commissaire à la concurrence, notre président vient de le rappeler, vous présidez aux destinées d'une politique pour laquelle il n'y a pas de consultation obligatoire du comité des régions, ni d'ailleurs de processus de décision pardon, au Parlement européen. Votre venue témoigne d'un signe d'ouverture remarquable. Il est vrai que la Direction générale de la politique de concurrence s'est déjà dans le passé, et notamment sous l'autorité de votre prédécesseur Joachim Aloumia, montré ouvert au dialogue avec les collectivités terri territoriales en général et le, com et le comité des régions en particulier, ce malgré l'absence de cadre procédural. Tout d'abord, soyez assurés de notre soutien total en matière du dumping fiscal et je le dis aussi en tant que Belge, sachant que la Belgique a été condamnée en termes d'enquête de vos services pour ses rulings sur les profits excédentaires. Que la Commission mette un terme à la course au moins disant fiscal comme business model des Google, Apple et Amazon est une illustration de plus tangible pour les citoyens européens qui sont tout également acheteurs et consommateurs sur la valeur ajoutée du projet européen. C'est aussi essentiel pour les collectivités territoriales car en matière de fiscalité, pour reprendre l'adage de Lavoisier qui disait « rien ne se perd, rien ne se crée, tout se transforme ». Les fruits que certains États membres récoltent du fait du moins disant fiscal sont bien les pertes d'autres États membres, pertes de financement public essentielles pour le maintien des investissements des services publics. Cela étant dit, si au terme d'une procédure engagée par la Commission contre ces GAFA, un montant d'approximativement 15 milliards d'euros étant bien récupéré par la Commission, nous souhaitons que ce montant ne soit pas reversé aux États membres, mais bien au budget de l'Union européenne au titre de ressources propres. Cela permettrait notamment d'atténuer quelque peu les conséquences du fameux Brexit. Sur le dispositif Alumia, en matière d'aide d'État pour les services d'intérêt d'économie générale, je vous signale que le CDR avait plaidé pour une révision en profondeur de ce dispositif. Le CDR, le CDR pardon, avait d'ailleurs publié le 25 mai dernier une étude sur la question de savoir si et comment les collectivités locales et régionales ont été consultées, voire impliquées, lors de l'élaboration du rapport national sur la mise en œuvre du paquet Almunia. 
Il en ressort que les collectivités territoriales ne sont consultées que dans moins de la moitié des États membres, alors que ce sont elles qui gèrent les services publics et qui doivent mettre en pratique les règles relatives aux aides d'État. Nous en appelons donc à la Commission de procéder à une consultation directe des collectivités territoriales, soit d'exiger de la part des États membres comme conditionnalité exempte de les associer devant l'évolution du dispositif. Je voudrais enfin attirer votre attention sur une revendication contenue dans mon projet d'avis sur le logement. Nous souhaiterons en fait que la Commission accepte une révision de la décision 2012 21 Union européenne dans le sens d'un élargissement de l'accès au logement social au-delà des personnes les plus démunies aux groupes sociaux moins avantagés. Un tel élargissement serait conforme au pouvoir discrétionnaire des États membres en matière de fourniture, d'exécution, de financement et d'organisation des services des logements sociaux et confirmerait leur autonomie de décider de la manière dont elles utilisent la politique du logement en tant qu'un instrument visant à introduire la mixité sociale, donc éviter la ghettoisation. Merci. Merci beaucoup. La parole est maintenant à notre collègue euh, Christiane Buchmann. Madam Commissioner, on behalf of the EPP Group again, I would also like to take this opportunity to thank you for your intervention. I had the honor of serving as chair of the Econ Commission in the first half of this mandate, and in this context, I am following competition-related issues closely. As you recently pointed out, uh, competition rules exist for understanding what people need, how they choose products, and how companies' actions affect that choice. I couldn't agree with you. Competition matters. Competition is a consumer issue, and we all need to be properly informed of what we are buying and if this is done at a fair price. The prerequisite is fair competition among qualified entrepreneurs. I come from the region of Steiermark in Austria, a region with a strong automotive industry. The Commission's recent announcement of its decision to impose a fine of 34 million euros on five car safety equipment suppliers demonstrate what I mentioned above. This is the tenth cartel decision in the car sector during the last 10 years and one of many cartel decisions which affects not only the European consumer but also other companies. It is not only a matter of higher prices and less innovation for the consumer but also a distortion or absence of fair competition among companies. Therefore, apart from praising the work the Cartels Directorate is undertaking, I would like to ask your view on the consequences which these decisions might have for the actual employees of the companies receiving a fine and how can you measure the cost to them. Concluding, I would uh, like to thank you for your contribution and for your attention and invite you to continue the cooperation you currently have with the European Committee of the Regions. Thanks very much. Merci beaucoup. La parole est maintenant à notre collègue Jean-Luc Van Raas. Mevrouw de commissaris, bijzonder dank dat u tot bij ons gekomen bent om zoals steeds een een klare en duidelijke boodschap te brengen. Ik denk dat dat sinds het begin van uw mandaat de grote heft is van dat u hebt, u, u spreekt een duidelijke taal en uh, mensen weten dat u de zaken niet met omwegen uh, aanpakt. Uw hoofdtaak is natuurlijk mogelijk te maken dat er een billijke, faire competitie is uh, binnen onze EU. En ik denk dat u daar perfect in slaagt. Nog uh, onlangs uh, uh, hebt u, uh, of zult u nog een aantal tussenkomsten moeten doen. Het is daar straks gesproken geweest over de Belgische biermarkt, maar ook over uh, uh, Duitse airtransport. Dus uh, we zijn ervan overtuigd dat u daar ook weer uw uh, vaste positie zult innemen. U hebt uh, lang gesproken over uh, staatsschulp en dat is uiteraard voor ons een, een heel belangrijk uh, item. Uh, staatsschulp is natuurlijk uh, vereist enkel daar waar dat het uh, niet toe strekt van een faire competitie te dwarsbomen uh, of in een uh, wanorde te brengen. U bent erin geslaagd inderdaad van het aantal... Um, tussenkomsten te beperken of te vragen, het aantal keren dat men aan u moet vragen van tussen te komen, om dat te beperken, dat is heel duidelijk en dat brengt ertoe bij dat er veel meer rechtszekerheid is dan vroeger, wat een heel goede zaak is. 
Maar wij zijn de vertegenwoordigers van de regio's. En heel dikwijls is het nog zo dat natuurlijk als er een aantal regels en die guidelines staan met, met een grote bureaucratie eraan als die overgebracht worden naar de regio's, is het nog altijd soms zo, veel minder dan vroeger, dat die bureaucratie, die onzekerheid voor de regio's tamelijk zwaar is. En ik zou u vragen van daarover te blijven waken dat dat uh, enigszins vereenvoudigd blijft. U hebt daar een enorme inspanning gedaan, maar het zou nuttig zijn aan uw administratie te vragen van verder die weg op te zetten. En vooral de vereenvoudiging van de administratie. Communicatie is geen probleem, maar een tussenwaardige bureaucratie is vooral uh, voor onze lokale entiteiten uh, soms heel zwaar. Ik had de eer rapporteur te zijn niet zo lang geleden uh, um, over een, uh, een, de problematiek van een, een faire en billige taxatie uh, binnen Europa. U weet als uh, al die groep is ons, uh, ons zicht daarop tamelijk duidelijk. Uh, voor ons moeten de belastingen zo laag mogelijk zijn, maar het moet voor iedereen op een gelijke manier kunnen worden toegepast. En taxfraude en uh, uh, wat de zogenaamde tax havens zijn dan ook totaal onaanvaardbaar. Zowel binnen als buiten Europa. Helaas buiten Europa. Ik weet dat u daar ook zware inspanningen doet, maar is het heel moeilijk om uh, te komen tot, uh, tot goede resultaten. We hopen dat de zaken toch verder gunstig evolueren zoals ze nu bezig zijn. Maar binnen Europa is het duidelijk zo dat als SME's en uh, uh, zelfstandige werkers een normale tax moeten betalen, dat ook geldt uiteraard voor de multinationals. En daar steunen we echt uh, volledig uh, uw politiek. U bent daar heel streng in en dat is natuurlijk een gunstige zaak. We zitten natuurlijk nog altijd met één probleem, één discussie dat we sinds tien jaar voeren binnen Europa. Dat is de zware discussie over de Common Consolidated Corporate Tax. Herinner u aan, ongeveer tien jaar geleden is men begonnen van daarover te discussiëren. Nog steeds is daar geen eensgezinde opinie over. En ik denk dat dat een enorme bijdrage zou kunnen leveren tot de harmonisatie van onze uh, corporate tax binnen Europa. Dank u. Merci beaucoup. La parole est maintenant à notre collègue Tadeusz Truskolaski. Pani komisarz, panie przewodniczący, szanowni państwo, dziękuję za możliwość zabrania głosu w tak ważnej debacie. Temat konkurencyjności jest niezwykle ważny. Wszystkim nam zależy na sukcesie europejskich przedsiębiorców. Ostatecznie ich sukces przełoży się na wyższą jakość życia, dobrobyt wszystkich obywateli. Te osiągnięcia gospodarcze nie będą jednak możliwe bez naszych działań na rzecz startupów i scale-upów. W lipcu bieżącego roku Komitet Regionów przyjął opinię dotyczącą startupów i scale-upów mojego autorstwa. W dokumencie zwróciliśmy uwagę na potrzebę przeprowadzenia analiz dotyczących możliwości wsparcia samorządów w powoływaniu zespołów złożonych z przedstawicieli biznesu, doświadczonych osób, które pomagałyby w rozwoju przedsiębiorczości oraz przedsiębiorstw typu startup i scale-up na terenie danej jednostki samorządu terytorialnego. Utworzenie podstaw wizy startupowej, katalogu warunków umożliwiających bezpieczne i korzystne przyjęcie wykwalifikowanego kapitału intelektualnego oraz finansowego z państw trzecich, harmonizacji systemów prawnych w zakresie postępowania upadłościowego, merytorycznego i finansowego wsparcia władz krajowych w specjalizacji sędziów i y, profesjonalizacji zarządców ustanawianych w ramach postępowań upadłościowych, rozluźnienia procedur w zakresie finansowania startupów i scale-upów ze względu na innowacyjny charakter ich przedsięwzięć oraz trudność w szacowaniu rezultatów. Wspieranie przedsiębiorstw typu startup i scale-up w Europie z perspektywy lokalnej i regionalnej jest ważnym czynnikiem w kierunku zwiększenia liczby miejsc pracy w naszych regionach. Tak więc e, uważam, iż władze publiczne szczebla krajowego, regionalnego i lokalnego powinny inicjować bądź angażować się w kampanie społeczne uświadamiające znaczenie porażki do sukcesu biznesowego i kampanie promujące kulturę ratowania przedsiębiorstw zamiast ich likwidowania. Bardzo dobrze, że pojawił się pomysł utworzenia Europejskiego Funduszu Venture Capital. Może warto pomyśleć o jego oddziałach w biurach regionalnych. Jaki jest stosunek Komisji Europejskiej do, do tej kwestii? Dziękuję za uwagę i mam nadzieję na dobrą współpracę w przyszłości.
Merci beaucoup. La parole est maintenant à notre collègue euh, euh, Daiva Matoniene. Dear Commissioner, on behalf of the European Conservatives and Reformist Group, I would like to welcome you to the plenary session uh, to the European Uri Union of the Regions. EU competition policy is an area where the EU action brings common added value to, to all citizens. It is an important tool for ensuring a level playing field for our common market so that we can create equal opportunities for all. It is important to recognize that creating economic prosperity in Europe would not be possible without eliminating trade barriers. One of the primary goals of the EU should be to further remove barriers to trade and reduce red tapes. Our citizens from Portugal to Poland and from Italy to Finland do not want a political union. What we want from us is to help them to build prosperity in regions where we live, work and have children. Europe also needs more fair fiscal competition between its regions. Physical competition would allow them to attract investments and creating job opportunities. Dear Commissioner, allow me to bring the case of Lombardy and Veneto regions in Italy. On 22nd October in this year, citizens of Italy northern regions of Lombardy and Veneto voted for greater autonomy from the central Italian government. In this specific case, substantial resources are generated at the region level, but they do not remain there to help local governments meeting local needs. For example, from Concomercio showed that if public services in Italy as a whole would cost the same as in Lombardy, the country would save 74 billion euro. The EU should support both physical decentralization as well as fiscal responsibility. Dear Commissioner, we welcome your efforts in combating tax evasion, tax fraud and aggressive tax avoidance. But at the same time, we reiterate that tax evasion and tax com competition are two separate issues. For our economies uh, to flourish, we need to combat the former and the current, the latter. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. La parole est maintenant à notre collègue, Madame Mao Persius. Merci, euh, Madame la Commissaire, de votre visite et des progrès que vous impulsez euh, en matière de concurrence et par là même en matière d'équité au sein de l'Union européenne. Alors, l'Union euh, investit beaucoup pour renforcer les réseaux euh, d'interconnexion entre ces territoires, mais les zones insulaires sont encore trop souvent exclus des bénéfices de ces investissements. Dans le cas des transports, cela est encore plus évident. Les îles ne, ne tirent pas forcément euh, avantage des investissements réalisés dans les transports à grande vitesse, ni d'ailleurs des opportunités en matière de « sharing economy ». Dans les régions insulaires, le transport aérien est souvent le seul moyen de transport à grande vitesse pour assurer le droit à la mobilité des personnes, mais aussi la compétitivité des entreprises. Il est d'ailleurs fréquemment sujet à des défaillances de marché à cause de l'absence de compétition dans les moyens alternatifs. Dans la perspective de garantir les mêmes chances aux citoyens européens, ne peut-on considérer, au moins dans le transport aérien, des exemptions ou des modifications dans le régime des aides d'État pour pouvoir affronter de manière adaptée les handicaps spécifiques et reconnus par l'article 174 du traité que connaissent les îles et leurs 17 millions d'habitants. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Euh, voilà, Madame la Commissaire, vous avez entendu les différents points de vue d'un certain, certain nombre de membres de ce comité, et c'est avec plaisir que je vous cède la parole à nouveau pour réagir à ce qui a été dit. Thank you, uh, and thank you for, uh, for your views. I, I very much appreciate sort of the tour d'horizon because it reflects uh, the engagement uh, in these issues that, uh, that we work with. Uh, allow me uh, to start uh, with the rapporteur, Mr. Mr. Murphy, and, and the question he, he raised. Uh, first and foremost, we are already uh, working with the Irish government uh, to see how to mitigate uh, if consequences for the Irish economy uh, because of Brexit will be as severe as can be feared. 
Uh, and we have started setting up a working group uh, in order to see if we, if we at all have to challenge state aid rules or if we can find uh, solid, well-tested solutions within our rules already. Uh, I'm quite optimistic on that uh, aspect uh, because so far uh, we have not run into, into barriers. Uh, but as you can hear, it's already uh, in the workshop, uh, it's on the working table uh, because of, uh, of the comfort I think that is needed uh, for the Irish uh, community in these very, very tricky uh, months and years where uncertainty is coming and you're not, not certain that it's followed by business opportunities. Second, on the point of, uh, of agriculture, uh, one of the things that, that I find very important is to make sure that in the different sort of parts of the value chain that we enable uh, strength. Uh, it's also important that we uh, enable uh, sort of get, get more from the market. If we at all can enable uh, higher prices and lower costs in, in the farmer part of, of the chain, that would be an excellent thing. Also because then the risk for consumers to pay higher prices is then minimized. Uh, for us, uh, we have had examples in, in the past which shows that among farmers, there can be issues between smaller and big and very big farmers. So it's important to make the rules sufficiently flexible also for small farmers not to see themselves basically coerced uh, into organizations uh, controlled by by the much uh, bigger uh, in that field. And I think it is important to keep working on that, uh, also because you've probably seen the latest communication from the Commission on the future um, uh, reform of uh, agricultural support. It's very ambitious, it's very modern, and sort of the, the, the part of it is also to take agriculture into our digitalized world, to make sure that all the knowledge, the digitalization, the possibilities coming from that is equally shared uh, also with uh, smaller farmers uh, and the farming uh, community. Uh, unfair competition on, on seeds and pesticides, uh, you're probably referring to the fact that now we have, uh, we're doing merger control on the Bio Monsanto merger. Uh, we've already had uh, concentration in this sector already. Uh, also before we had the merger of Syngenta um, and, uh, and the merger of Dove Dupont. So of course we look very carefully uh, at the competition issues here. And the competition issues here is of course that farmers should still have choice, uh, affordable prices, both when it comes to seeds and pesticides. Uh, this is our obligation uh, in the merger procedure and we are now in the phase where we go in great, great detail in order to understand the different markets because they are different markets. It's not the same thing if it's wheat or corn or uh, vegetables. So we go into great detail to make sure that, uh, that we get it right. Uh, I share with you uh, uh, sort of the good news of, uh, of geo-blocking. I think it's a very good thing. What is sometimes forgotten is that e-commerce is also a great advantage to small and medium-sized businesses because it gives you an opportunity to expand your business, uh, where back in the days you would have to set up brick-and-mortar shops, uh, hire staff, uh, have inventory on place, where now you can develop your business uh, with an e-commerce uh, perspective. And unfortunately, as it were, uh, quite few of our small and medium-sized businesses actually have this endeavor and this ambition. But we hope that the new set of rules will enable them to a larger degree to grow their business, to add sort of the e-commerce uh, part also if you're a small and medium-sized business. Uh, the first part of your question, the question of the national competition authorities, is, is a question very close to heart. Because we have tabled a proposal uh, with the Parliament and the Council to empower our national competition authorities. Because sometimes uh, consumers suffer uh, not because of cross-border big companies uh, cartelizing or misuse of dominant position, but because of national or even regional cartels. So it is important for our national competition authorities uh, to be able to get the evidence, uh, to do their investigation, and to hand out fines that are truly felt. Uh, because otherwise, of course, there's no deterrent when it comes to doing the wrong thing. So I very much hope that, uh, that you will uh, keep supporting, because I feel a very strong support for this empowerment of the no national competition authorities to, to pass it through parliament and then uh, council. And of course, a very basic thing, which is the legal guarantees of their independence. Because sometimes competition authorities, they bring bad news. 
uh, they bring news that are contrary, contrary to what a government might want to hear. Uh, because they, they break up coziness uh, between businesses and, and, and politics. Uh, and I think in that respect, it is very important uh, to have the independence. So thank you very much uh, for your uh, comments in, in that respect. Um, the question of, uh, of social housing is a, is a question which uh, I think is very important because it's of interest in every member state. And, uh, and we have been doing our best to make the rules clear because there was a lot of uncertainty uh, just a few years ago. I, um, I take your comments uh, uh, with me because we will have a, a closer look to see if some of the issues you raised uh, are in any way uh, disabled by the set of rules that we have already, and I'll be more than happy uh, to come back on that. Uh, what you say about uh, sort of uh, the lack of, of formal structures, formal uh, co-decision procedures, uh, well, this is the world as it is right now, but I don't think that that should be a barrier actually to have a true structural exchange of opinions. Uh, which is why it, it makes uh, great sense, sense to me uh, to take on board the views uh, here today and, of course, uh, in the structured way of, uh, of uh, the work of, uh, of your rapporteur. Uh, I think that makes, that makes a very, very uh, great sense. Um, uh, Mr. Uh, Buchmann is, uh, is referring to the, the car cartels. And, and this is a work that's been going on for so long. Uh, it seems as if there's no part of a car that cannot be cartelized. Uh, we, we are now on, on the 10th uh, decision. Uh, we have the car parts, cartels. Uh, I think we are on a total of seven, still have some to go. Uh, we have the truck cartel. Uh, and in total, uh, these uh, cartel decisions uh, means uh, fines being paid of uh, 6 billion euros in total. Uh, you probably know that fines of uh, cartel decision and misuse of dominant uh, decision, they are being redistributed to member states uh, once the courts uh, are done uh, looking at it. And of course, we pre prepare to win uh, in court. Uh, they are being redistributed to member states according to the same key uh, as, uh, as um, contributions uh, to the European budget. So fines come back uh, basically to citizens, and, and I think that is a, that's a very uh, important uh, point. Uh, well, the, the sad thing, of course, is that uh, employees in, in businesses that engage in cartels, uh, they have to, to live with, uh, with the very bad consequences of sometimes high fines being paid. Of course, we have the very rare occasion where the, there is inability to pay because a, a company uh, should not be driven to bankruptcy uh, because of the fine, then solutions are being, being found. But if, if an employee has a fear that something wrong is going on or is about to happen, we have established a, a whistleblower facility so that you can communicate, communicate uh, with the commission anonymously to say, I think something wrong is going on. Maybe you should have a second look. Uh, and in that, of course, prevents uh, long duration of cartels because long duration of cartels is also the thing that makes the fines go up. Uh, to a quite significant uh, degree, because then, of course, consumers have suffered uh, for longer. Um, uh, Mr. Uh, now I don't read my own terrible uh, handwriting. Um, Mr. Luchmann? Uh, yes, on, uh, on the point of red tape, uh, I'm very much aware of that, because what seems to be a single, simple guideline for a bureaucrat may be a mountain of bureaucracy uh, for someone who just wants to make sure that you can support the building up of a digital infrastructure. So of course we keep looking at the language we use, if the guideline can be used as recipes uh, for investment to make sure that you get it right, because the endeavor to empower uh, regions and member states is of course definitely not an, an, a thing that will end. We will, uh, with all the things I mentioned, we will keep uh, on track to make sure that uh, that decision makers can actually uh, use this. Uh, I very much uh, share with you uh, what you said about the common con consolidated corporate tax base. Uh, it has a very long history. We have redone the proposal because there were criticism of technical issues. So now it is uh, on the table of council. Uh, I also share with you that this is a very important proposal because it would make it much easier for small and medium-sized businesses 
They will know if I am in two, three, four uh, European member states, what's the tax base? So they can save on tax advisors and, and accountants because they know the tax base. For multinationals, it will be equally difficult to use differences in the tax base to organize themselves to avoid taxes. And this is why this is a structural proposal and very good. Uh, under the leadership of uh, my colleague Pierre Moscovici, uh, quite a lot of legislation has changed over the uh, last couple of years, will come in effect uh, next year and next year again. A lot of that is based on the work of the OECD to prevent the erosion of tax bases and to prevent profits from being shifted from high tax to medium tax to low or no tax uh, constituencies. Uh, on that note, uh, Pierre Moscovici is almost ready to publish the blacklist of uh, third country uh, tax jurisdictions, uh, which enables uh, tax avoidance, also the very aggressive uh, tax avoidance that you know of. The thing is that we need two more things. We need, of course, member states to implement, to make it a priority for tax authorities to have the right people on board, who has the skills to, to use the new legislation to get taxation right. And the second thing we need is, of course, for citizens to see that it's working, which is why I think that country-by-country country reporting in the public is a good thing, because then you can check for yourself. Does this company, maybe a favorite company, where I do my business, do they also contribute uh, to the society where they do their business? Uh, we already have country-by-country country reporting uh, from multinationals to tax authorities, uh, so it's not a big step also to make it public. And for financial institutions, we already have public-by-country public, uh, um, public country reporting because that was put in place by the parliament when banking legislation was changed uh, a couple of years ago. So we already have a real-life experience that shows that it is doable and that it doesn't harm the, the, the businesses uh, in question. <coughs> Uh, Mr. Uh, Trokolashki uh, asked about the scale-up and, and the startups, and I, I agree that, that the things can be done in order to support the businesses better. Uh, I'd, I'd mention uh, something in, in, a, in addition to this, and this is that a number of the businesses who are in the startup phase, what they need the most is customers. Uh, customers who come to their door say, I would like to buy your product. And, uh, and here, I think you have a role to play also to use the opportunities to make public tenders uh, accessible for smaller businesses. Uh, because with, the, with the, the, the revised rules on public tenders, it is easier to, to sort of cut them up in smaller pieces for smaller businesses actually to take part. Uh, and I think that is important because uh, you can have all the support you, you want, but if you don't have uh, customers, it's very difficult uh, to grow your, your company. Um, Mrs. Matonier uh, asked about uh, barriers to trade, uh, and this is, of course, exactly uh, what we're dealing with. Uh, one thing, though, uh, and it is that, as you say, one thing is, is tax competition by the front door, because we have allowed, uh, among ourselves, for member states to set the level of corporate taxation by themselves. But what we see is that it is the small and medium-sized businesses who pay the taxes. It's not the multinationals. Uh, Pierre Moscovici, well, of course, some do. I shouldn't generalize like this. This is, this is completely unfair. Some, some do not pay their taxes. And Pierre Moscovici and his team, they say, well, we have a, a possibility of more than, than 50 billion euros per year uh, of corporate taxation if done the right way. It's a lot of money in public coffers, uh, either depending on political decisions, if one wanted them to reduce other taxes, or spend for better quality in education, health, uh, the things that, that people are in, uh, in demand for. Uh, last but not least, uh, Madame uh, Mopatius, there, uh, on the question of, uh, of dom toms uh, and, and other outmost regions. It is, uh, it is recognized in our treaty, you know that uh, even better uh, than me, and, and one of the things in the re reversed uh, general block exemption regulation is exactly to make sure that the outermost regions have better conditions. Because as you say, they are far away from mainland Europe. They are to some degree struggling. And this is why we have made the rules much easier to apply and, and with much more room also sometimes for operating aid uh, for businesses and to make sure that we don't have sort of artificial distinctions between different sectors 
but to make it easier in order to have the local and, re and regional uh, economies of our outmost uh, regions work better. Uh, because there is this uh, full, wholehearted uh, commitment uh, from continental Europe uh, to our utmost regions. And this is now also, I think, clearly re reflected uh, in our state aid rules. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Madame la Commissaire, pour ces réponses très précises. Et si nous avions le temps, nous pourrions encore continuer à discuter de ces sujets particulièrement passionnants et importants pour la qualité du travail au sein de l'Union européenne. Un grand merci de nous avoir consacré aujourd'hui le temps nécessaire pour ce débat et j'espère que nous pourrons le prolonger à une prochaine occasion. Merci beaucoup. Merci.